OK, that's a quick look at the unique foundations on which the Arantia book's scientific story sits. Let's now see what these foundations mean for mass and matter. As we know, everyday stuff is made from molecules. Molecules are built from atoms, and atoms are complex things built from tiny parts. These tiny parts are called leptons and quarks, which are thought to be elementary, that is to say, not made from smaller parts. This scheme, based on leptons and quarks, is called the standard model of particle physics, and it describes most things we see really well. But in particle physics, all this is thought of as low-energy stuff, which implies another high-energy domain. Which is where the Arantia book comes in. The Arantia book approaches this standard model from the other high-energy side, introducing these ancestral levels of not-quite-finite stuff, which we just explored. In the middle here, between what we can measure and what's been revealed, we have a region of interest. It's interesting to scientists, they want to know more about leptons and quarks. It's interesting to Urantia book readers, they want to know how ultimatons fit in. OK, so what do we know? Well, we know that for the standard model to work, this region of interest needs to be filled with something called a condensate of charge. What's a condensate and what kind of charge? We'll get to that, but first let's introduce the ultimaton. Imagine a rain cloud condensing out of thin air and a drop of rain condensing inside that cloud. If we think of the cloud as segregata, then this tiny drop would be the ultimaton. Notice how this drop of rain, this ultimaton, becomes a condensate of a condensate. To put this in more mathematical terms, think of a tiny vortex in this condensate, this not quite finite stuff. And think of this tip as something discrete, a quantum of superfluid spin, an ultimaton. The idea is that segregata can be cooled and condensed into ultimatons or, as physicist Lisa Randall might say, sequestered onto our measurable manifold. But before these ultimatons can be put to work, first they need to, quote, huddle. Now, by huddling, I imagine something like this, two or three ultimatons locked very, very tight, a bit like the way quarks are confined inside protons. Mathematically, we'd have a balance of forces, mutual attraction drawing a few ultimatons together, while some extreme repulsion, say from an anti-symmetric spin, keeps them apart. It's this sort of balance between mutual attraction and extreme repulsion that explains that, quote, proclivity to huddle mentioned in paper 42, section 7. It's these two characteristics of ultimatons, their quantized superfluid spin, and their proclivity to huddle, that allow us to make contact with standard model physics. What we have here is the binding of near absinite energies into finite angular momentum. And angular momentum is something that science can measure. So this region of interest will contain not isolated ultimatons, but clusters of them huddling. Now, notice what we have. Clusters of ultimatons spinning in a condensate of charge. As we'll see, this extraordinary place where spin gets tangled up with charge. Where spin gets tangled up with charge becomes the perfect place for revelation to make first contact with native science. Let's take a closer look. What we need to do is to work out how this primitive spinning thing, this tiny polarized huddle of ultimatons, might interact with this condensate of charge. 
and then to show how leptons and quarks can be built up from clusters of these primitive spinning things. Here I should point out that our standard model already depends fundamentally on a mysterious interaction between these leptons and quarks and this condensative charge. This is the famous Higgs mechanism by which particles are thought to get an interactive, inertial kind of mass. But notice that if standard model particles really are built up from clusters of huddling ultimatons, then what we're predicting, what we're predicting is that this Higgs mechanism is actually caused by the behavior of ultimatons, some kind of ultimatonic torsion interacting with this condensative charge. And as we'll see, this condensative charge, this Higgs-type field, turns out to be a lot like segregata, the very stuff from which ultimatons are made. Of course, if standard model particles like electrons and neutrinos and quarks really are built up from clusters of huddling ultimatons, then once again our ideas about what's elementary will need to change. As it turns out, scientists have been wondering about this for some time. How elementary are elementary particles? To find out, they built a really big machine. The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. In 2012, the BBC made a documentary about what scientists hoped to achieve with this machine. Here's a 60-second clip. In the summer of 2012, scientists at the LHC announced the discovery of the famous Higgs particle. It's the final piece of what's called the Standard Model, a set of 17 fundamental particles, including quarks and electrons, that make up everything we know. Fundamental particles is a, is a myth, I think. Um, it looks at the moment as if quarks and electrons are point-like particles. We can't see any size to them, but that is just a, because we haven't been able to measure very short distances around them. What I'd like to see is what's going on inside them. So we're looking for the innards of the quarks by smashing them together as hard as we can. As you can see, scientists really do wonder about the internal structure of quarks. But there's a problem. If leptons and quarks are made from smaller parts, then the next natural level down is the so-called Planck scale, which implies inaccessible energies and lengths. So any such internal substructure would seem to be forever beyond human capacity to prove. But if something is beyond human capacity to prove, do those, quote, limitations of revelation from paper 101 still apply? Now, about this condensate of charge. This charge is called weak hypercharge, and this condensate is thought to fill all space. This is the famous Higgs-type field. Since the 1970s, our standard model for particle physics has assumed that this kind of condensate exists. In 2012, scientists claimed to have proven that it does. But condensate of weak hypercharge is a mouthful, so Professor Leonard Susskind likes to call this stuff zilch. Zilch. I'll let the professor explain. We need a name for it. We don't have a name for it. Well, we do have a name for it. It's a very awkward name. It's called the weak hypercharge. I don't like that. Because it's a thing which emits the Z bosons, I call it zilch. <laughs> zilch. Zilch is like electric charge, but it's not electric charge. So why does this matter? Well, think of a standard model particle, say a Z boson, which the professor goes on to explain. It's the interaction of this sort of standard model particle with standard model zilch that's thought to generate an interactive or standard model type of mass. 
Now, by interaction, scientists mean something like this. A Z boson hooks onto a bit of zilch, then lets it go. This is the Higgs mechanism. This is what got the 2013 Nobel Prize for Physics. Z bosons hooking into this condensative zilch. We don't have a name for this mixture of Z boson plus zilch, but since it's so central to the Higgs mechanism, Susskind likes to call this quantum state a zigs. Yep, a zigs. But here's the thing. In the standard model, it's this interaction with zilch, this flipping between Z boson and zigs, that's sought to give this particle its interactive, inertial type of mass. So why is this interesting? Well, scientists currently use a similar scheme to give electrons this same interactive kind of mass. In the standard model, electrons continually flip between left and right hand states. In their left hand state, electrons have zilch, or weak hypercharge. In their right hand state, no zilch. To explain this difference between left and right hand states, this so-called broken symmetry, the standard model requires that electrons continually absorb and then emit some quantum of zilch. Mathematically, they absorb and emit a zigs. It's this zigs that carries the zilch. And it's the rate at which electrons absorb and emit this zilch the rate at which they interact and flip between left and right hand states that defines their interactive or Higgs type mass. In 1930, Schrodinger gave this flipping, this trembling oscillation, a name. <laughs> Let's call it Zitter for short. But here's where it gets weird. Mathematically, for this left right flipping to work, the electron needs a few moving parts. In the standard model, the so-called Dirac electron is actually a tangle of more primitive things, two pairs of virtual vial spinners. Dirac used these entangled spinners to help define those left and right hand states. Mathematically, it's these internal parts that interact with zilch. <laughs> 